Okay, hi everyone, I'm Adam from Open Learning, and you may know me from seeing me on Open Learning, chatting to me when you have questions, or just seeing me around the site. So I'm really thrilled to be here and to be working with Professor Mushtaq and obviously with Richard, and it's pretty cool that we're all here in Malaysia. Um, I flew all the way from Sydney to see all of you, um, but obviously you can see me online. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share an experience I've had in the past, this is going back about three years ago now, of something that happened to me when I first finished university. So I was probably not far from where you were sitting. So it, it's quite an interesting experience and it was completely unexpected. Um, but it had some very interesting ramifications and it made a huge impact on my life. So that's what I want to share with you today. Kind of that story and what I've learned from it and how I've kind of carried that through to everything I do now. So the endeavor was called Vodafail and there's a very simple reason for it. And what happened was when I first, when I effectively graduated university, it was at the end of 2010, and I was just starting to look at, you know, what I should do with my life and all those sort of big picture things. And I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm a cool, like, you know, university graduate. I need a fancy new phone. And I heard all the cool kids use Vodafone. So I thought, oh, I'll try that. You know, I can be a cool kid too. So I got one of these, like, you know, fancy smartphones. This was like 2010. So I was like, oh, you know, I'll try this thing out. So what I did was I got the phone and very quickly it like just didn't work. Like you know how you go and you try and like browse the internet and it completely fails and like you try and call someone and then like the call drops and then someone sends you a text message saying, hey, where are you? And the text message was like five days late. So all of these sort of experiences, although somewhat common, kind of compounded. Um, and then I had a lot of other like issues with it as well. So my girlfriend was actually in a car accident. And I couldn't reach her on the phone because every time she called, the call dropped out. So I thought to myself, like, this is really unacceptable. People rely on phones. They rely on all this modern infrastructure. But there seemed to be no guarantee that it would work and just an expectation that it would work as the ad said. So obviously, like, when you're in these situations, the first thing you do is, like, what do you do? Do you call up, like, customer service? Like, has it, have any of you had these issues with your phone before? And what do you, do you call up? You post on, like, Facebook or something? Yeah, so, so you can try all that stuff. And it actually, like, it didn't work at all. So I was like, effectively, what I had to do was I kept calling up. I went in the store, and they said, oh, you can't come into the store. You've got to go online. So I go online, and they say, oh, we can't help you. It must be your phone. So I spent, like, hours and hours on the phone, on hold, talking to a customer service center in another country. It wasn't Malaysia, actually, which would have been cool if it was. But now, I have waited a lot of time on hold. I thought to myself, OK, well, what can I do while I'm on hold that will actually make a difference in this situation? So I thought, oh, well, I'm a software engineer. And you know, I made a lot of websites in the past, so maybe I'll make a website for this. So I looked up, and I'm like, you know, what's the situation? This is like Vodafone. So I was like, oh, Vodafail. So I looked on like, a domain registration site. And the, the domain name was available. So I was like, wow, this is too good an opportunity to pass up. Like, no one's bought this domain name. So I had to purchase it, and I did. And then one day, it was like a Sunday, I was waiting on hold, and I thought, the hold music's like, OK, it's not too bad. So while I'm on hold, I'll just make a website. So I made a very simple website. And effectively, the simple premise was, I thought, well, they probably won't listen to me, because I'm just one person. And when you're a big company with millions of customers, you think, you probably think, oh, I lose like a few hundred customers every day. So it's no big deal. Like, so they don't really care about the individual too much. So what I did was I thought, OK, if I get lots of people together, and then exp they talk about how much they hate the service, or what pain it's causing them in their lives, then maybe the company will listen. And it came back to the simple premise that, if you just share how you're feeling about a service and what it's done to you, like your story, so to speak, then that makes you feel better, actually. And it also informs other people as to what's actually happening. Because one of the things we didn't, I didn't know was, was I the only person in Australia who had these problems? Or was everyone else having it, but they were just really too scared or you know, too complacent to do anything? So I made this simple website. And I thought, OK, I'll tell some people about it. So I posted on some like, web forums that were like, one was called Whirlpool. It's a really big like, technology forum in Australia. 
And then I posted on Facebook, and Facebook was kind of funny, actually. So I put it on his Facebook page. Um, everyone would complain. So it just became like a complaints page. So I just replied to every single post with the website. And very quickly, I got blocked from posting on their Facebook page, but not before like 50 people saw the website. So that was a success. So I thought, OK, there's one way to do it. Um, and then I also figured, well, I'm waiting on hold. So when Vodafone finally answers the phone, I'll tell them I made a website. Maybe that'll make a difference to them. So I was like, hey, I made this website about your company. And they're like, oh, you know, we don't really care. So I was like, OK, fine. Well, this is like what the website looked like way back when. So I think one of the funny things about it is it wasn't designed very well, but it was designed with a very like, tongue-in-cheek sort of humor that really resonated with people. Like The entire website was initially meant to be satire. So you go there, and it's like, how do you lodge a complaint? And it's pretty much all jokes that I told. So I just make a bunch of jokes. And people like that. But I guess the key things were like you could share your story. There were Twitter, like a Twitter feed of all the complaints happening around Australia. And you could see what everyone else was posting as well. And down the line, I also ended up categorizing all of the complaints. So I figured, oh, there's actually like a few different themes. So like, I had problems with my phone dropping out. And then there were other issues. Ah, there's a really funny one. So um, there's like an automated phone service they had called Lara. And Lara was like the personality they gave to the, went to the person you, who you'd call up. So you call up Vodafone and it'd be like, hey, welcome to Vodafone. My name's Lara. How can I help you? And it's like you say what you want. So it's like, I'm having phone problems. And they're like, OK, just a minute. I didn't understand that. What was your problem again? It's like, my phone doesn't work. It's like, OK, thanks. I'm transferring you to billing. Like, th that was the, effectively the experience most people had. So there were tons of complaints just about this person named Lara. So it, it was actually quite funny to watch. And there were a bunch of others, and we cataloged all of them. And it turned out a lot of them were like not just in Australia. There were other places in the world. Um, and I think that interested me quite a bit as well. Because I thought, initially I made this website for Australia. But Vodafone's in lots of countries. And they have lots of customers worldwide, and other countries have problems too. So that, that had a big impact on the way I thought about it as well. But so I made the website, and initially like a few people used it. So I thought, oh, wow, I've got like 20 complaints. I'm doing well here. But um, that was kind of just the start. So the first big break for the site was about six days after I started it. So I started on a Sunday. Then on like the Friday, where I'd just actually taken two months off from work for like my summer holiday before I started as a full-time graduate at the place I was working. So I thought, OK, I'm going to take two months off. I'm going to like, you know, think about what I want to do, you know, maybe travel a bit. But then almost immediately, um, Vodafone was in the press. So I got quite lucky, and the Sydney Morning Herald, which is one of the major newspapers in Australia, ran a little back page thing on the website. So all of a sudden, like 500 people posted on the site. And I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. And then there were a lot of spam posts like telling people to like die and stuff. But I deleted all of those, so a bit of a moderation thing as well. But the thing was, like, I was really impressed. I was like, wow, so many people saw this. So one of the, thing I, one of the things happened quickly is I had 1,000 people posting their stories. And some of the stories were, were quite, um, like, not so much impressive, but they were quite telling. Like, people would talk about how they lost jobs and they lost business. Because if you're like a plumber, then you use your mobile phone to book all of your jobs. And you wait for people or customers to call you back. And so it's this whole, um, it's this really vital piece of, piece of technology. And if that just doesn't work, then people's livelihoods are affected. And I think that was one of the really amazing things that, that I saw really quickly by reading these stories, was that the phone kind of used to just be like a social sort of tool. You just use it, and you talk to your friends. And if you can't reach them, you know, so be it. But so many people run their lives off of it. And so many people place so much importance on having the thing work all the time that when it doesn't, like, they're completely screwed. So those stories were really, really telling to me. And I started thinking about the trust people were placing in me as someone who just put up this website that kind of just let them share their stories. And, and then I thought about, what's the expectation of me with this website? Like, what am I supposed to do for these people? Because they're posting their stories on there. And I'm not Vodafone. Like, I can't actually fix their problems. Like, I hadn't even fixed my problem yet. So 
it, it was just something that was kind of weighing on my mind that I'll come back to. And then I also, through this entire time, I had some contact with Vodafone, either through their Facebook page or every time I called up to complain. And at one point, they did tell me they were aware of the site, and just please don't use their trademark, otherwise they'll, they'll complain about it. But at the end of the day, there's nothing they can really do, so I went on my merry way. Now, pretty quickly, there was another article, another week, a week after that, and this time it was front page of the uh, front page press in Australia. So it was on the front page of Sydney Morning Herald, and I kind of woke up at like 8:30 in the morning, and I like my phone's like full of messages. Actually, my phone didn't work. My laptop was like full of emails, and I was like, "Oh my God, what's going on?" And it was on the front page. And then I went to Google News, and I was like, "Oh wow, like there's like a picture of me next to a robot that um, I took." Because like one of the things is when when you're in the press. A lot of times they'll just email you and say, hey, can you send me a picture of yourself? And you'll think, ah, oh, okay, yeah, you want a picture? Well, here's a picture I took on my last holiday. And then that's the picture they put in the front page. So for me, it was actually a picture of me standing next to like a replica of the Mars rover from the, um, I forget what it's called. There's like a, uh, a radio telescope in Canberra in, in Australia. And I was there on a holiday, which would be probably, you know, yeah, Parks. Yeah, Parks Observatory. So I, I went to this observatory and I took a picture of me next to the, the Mars rover and I thought, man, I'm so cool, like engineer next to a Mars rover. So anyway, that's the picture that got published. So um, just if you're going to do things, just make sure you have a good picture of yourself because you know, you'll be looking at it for a long time. This is like four, three and a half years later and I still look at the picture of me next to the Mars rover. But I'm proud of it, so it's cool. But anyway, so it was on the front page and the reason for that was because um, a, a law firm was reading all of the stories posted on the website, and they thought, oh man, like these people have real problems. I can make some money off of this. So I guess they're pretty entrepreneurial as well, even though they're a law firm. So they thought, okay, well, we'll launch a class action investigation. Um, so as soon as they did that, they, and then the, they had a press conference, and you know, the, the press said, hey, why are you launching this thing? And they're like, well, we read on Vodafone that everyone has problems. So um, they credited uh, my website with that. So, Therefore, it was even bigger news. So <clears throat> it was quite amazing um, because over a period of three days, it was covered in every publication in Australia and on every major news station as well, and every radio station too. Like a lot of radio stations I had never heard of, and TV stations is only in Australia, so you, you know those ones. But I think one of the interesting things there is through this entire time, everyone talked about the website as like a social media triumph. And in many ways, it is, because it's like a very social thing that you share and you talk about. And, but it, it didn't have all the hallmarks of a social site. Like, there was no, initially there were no like Facebook sharing buttons anywhere. Like, you didn't log in with Facebook and it, you didn't invite your friends. It just so happened that the things people were doing, the stories that people were posting, were so interesting enough on their own that even without me doing anything, people wanted to share those with their friends, and they wanted to tell people about it, and they wanted to talk about it. So from the, when I first started, I probably only told you know, probably a couple dozen people through my Facebook posts and through my like, forum posts. And the forum posts were actually deleted almost immediately because they violated the forum policy that I was posting it on. So even with all of that, the stories were so interesting, and the other tools I developed were so useful as well. So I, be, I built things so you could input your um, mobile coverage at where you were in Australia, and then I generated a crowdsourced map of Vodafone's actual coverage, which conflicted quite heavily with um, what they had on the website. So all of these sort of tools were really interesting to people. And because of that, they shared it. And then because it was in the press, then that just increased the, the effect. So Vodafone as a company was really struggling to work out how to react to all of this. Um, because First of all, it was over Christmas break, which is, a, you know, in Australia, people take like three weeks off. So everyone went on holiday. Um, and the CEO sent out an apology. And he just said, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, I don't think there's any problem with this sort of stuff. So one of the big mistakes that the company made was that they just kept denying that there was a problem. Even in the face of like 10,000 stories from people who clearly said there was a problem, and people who called up on the radio stations, and people who talked about it, on like Twitter using like the Vodafone hashtag which was trending like throughout Australia for such a long time. 
but they still kept denying it. And I think there are a number of um, lessons in that for the company, which we'll look at. But one of the key ones is that you really obviously have to listen to your customers. I mean, if they have a problem, and so many of them have problems, you can't just keep blaming them, because eventually, you know, even if, it's, if it seems like their problem, if they leave you, you know, you're in trouble. So it, it's something to really think about. Um, and to make matters worse, the CEO decided to go on the, on the news and, and the press and actually say there was nothing wrong. So it, it was a, it's actually a big case study on what not to do. So when you're running your companies, just you can think of this and think, ah, what did they do? I'll do the opposite. But um, even with all of that happening and with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people on Vodafail, it was still like run out of my like, dining room table. So here's a picture um, we took at the time. It's like the Vodafail Command Center. It had like two laptops and a screen. And um, yeah, some like pizza I hadn't finished eating because I hadn't slept in days. So it was kind of funny actually um, because stories kept coming in and eventually what I ended up doing was recruiting a team of um, like moderators and supporters from around Australia who were quite really passionate about the problem and who really wanted to help people out. So it was quite interesting because I knew that I couldn't do all of these, I couldn't do everything on my own. Like there were so many stories being posted and although I, like, I really, I didn't have to do anything, it's important that people saw that there was a presence or a response in some cases. So the moderators that I recruited would actually go around and if people had problems that could be solved by Vodafone, we'd actually direct them to the right people to speak to. Um, because we kind of, after a few days, we knew, we knew how to get stuff done. Um, but I think one of the other interesting things I found was that we had to, to get people to post stories, it had to be very natural and it had to be anonymous. And so whenever you put an anonymous box on the internet, you'll get a lot of stuff coming through that you might not like. But it's one of the, like, the key things that kept the site so popular, that you didn't have to log in anywhere, you could just go in, you could post your story. People would write like 10,000 word stories and they wouldn't leave a name or any details. They just wanted to get it off their chest. And I think one of the, it made people feel really good about, about what they'd done. So they couldn't actually get their problem solved, but they could make themselves feel a little better, better by sharing it with people. Um, so, so that's what the site provided. And because of our desire to keep it both anonymous and like completely public, and not to like moderate comments before they were stories before they were posted, um, we had to do a lot of like moderation after the fact. So we had to do everything from removing people's contact details that they either accidentally posted online, or like removing names from like a hit list people made of people at Vodafone they hated. To like actually by the end of it, we actually had filters for things like the CEO's name because he came up so much, and people were sending him like death threats. So you have to be mindful of um, <laughs> some of these things. But um, so very quickly, there were like over 7,000 stories on the site. And one of the um, funnier things that happened was the CEO actually called me up and he wanted to, he wanted to talk to me. Because he's like, obviously, this, by this point, he'd been like on the TV shows like two days in a row. And like his PR department had gone on holiday. And it was pretty much just like him. And he was like, I mean, so, so he was talking about it. And he's like, you know, I just need to meet you to see. Um, see what, this, what, what all, all this stuff is. And I think the funny thing about it was he didn't know if I was some crazy person or some like rational person, but he's like, he just had to find out. And he, I think he, he got lucky in the sense that I think I'm quite rational. I could have been a crazy person. Um, but but, but I, I ended up meeting him and um, I met with his, him and his director of customer service. And we pretty much just laid out all of the problems that we had seen through the stories that were being posted on the site and all the data we collected that proved that there were problems. Um, so effectively, they reassured me that they were on top of it and they were going to fix it. Um, but obviously, like, you know, the proof is in the pudding, is the saying they have. So until it actually works, you can't tell me it's fixed. Um, and even now, three years later, they're still struggling to, to get over that, get over that conception that it still doesn't work. Um, and a lot of people still think it doesn't work. So it's very difficult once you come from that, from that uh, mindset of like, telling the customer that things are fine even though they aren't. It's really hard to get away from that. Um, but by this stage, like, there was just so much press and so much attention 
uh, on the site that I decided, I kind of reflected to myself and I thought, okay, well, 10,000 or 12,000, however many people at the time, had, had really trusted me with their stories. They'd really put themselves out there. They talked about how they were losing business because of Vodafone, how it was hurting their relationship, all of these sort of things. Um, and I was you know, keeping the pressure up on Vodafone as well, and they were starting to release more information about how you can actually get out of your contract. Because the, the, thi the funny thing about it was, all I really wanted was to get out of my contract, which I had just signed four weeks prior, which like, you're really supposed to be able to do legally in Australia. So I really just wanted to get out of my contract, and they wouldn't let me out. So if they just let me out of my contract, like, none of this would have happened. So they realized that. So after that, they had like a procedure, and it's like, if you are having problems, call us, and we'll let you out of your contract. Like, they're just like, please, <laughs> don't let this happen again. Was the, um, but they still hadn't really fixed the problems, and progress was very slow. But, but I was thinking to myself, okay, so these people trusted me. They put their stories up there. They know that I'm not Vodafone, so I can't fix this network. I can't fix the customer service problems. Like, what, what on earth can I really do here? And I think one of the uh, interesting things that, that you always see about consumer activist campaigns is that they're very fleeting. Like, they, they come and go in an instant. And a lot of times, they make absolutely no impact. And a lot of times, they're just like a YouTube video. Like, someone makes a YouTube video, it goes viral, it's very funny. And like everyone says, oh, you know, that's a big problem. Someone should do something about it. And then, you know, it passes next day. And, and it, most campaigns are like that. Everything from political campaigns to, you know, when people run um, like petitions, they get like 100,000 signatures. And like, you know, they send the petition to some person in charge, and nothing ever happens. So th this was something I was really thinking about because um, this sort of voter fail campaign actually went on for about two months. And it's much longer than, than any sort of like 15 minute of fame or like YouTube video that gets, goes viral. So I was really trying to think of how could I turn all of this anger that people have, all of these problems people have, or challenges, I should probably say in this course, so I don't use the P word. But t turn all of those um, challenges and difficulties into something constructive that actually makes a difference. Um, and this was something that, that, really, that really weighed on me. And because I didn't want this to be one of those campaigns that just came and went and nothing happened. So I, I really wanted to, to make a difference with it. So I thought, how can I turn this anger into something constructive? And, um, and that, was, that was really challenging. But um, I started working on it. <clears throat> and I had about uh, four people around Australia who were helping uh, moderate the site and bouncing ideas off of. So we, so we had this like, group going. And I never met these people in person, but I trusted them completely, just based on, like, I don't know. They seem like nice people online, so sometimes you just have to be trusting. But there were a lot of other things that, that were happening to Vodafone at the time, so completely unrelated to my website. Um, although my web, although Vodafone became like the focal point of all of these. So one was that there was a privacy breach, so like all of the customer records were released on the internet or something ridiculous. So the privacy commissioner had to investigate. And then there was a problem with like the resellers selling data to different people. So then like that was in the news. So all of these different stories kept coming up, and they kept reinforcing the idea that there are like serious fundamental problems. Um, and it all came back to Vodafone, even though I really had um, nothing to do, uh, for the most part, with those stories. Um, at the same time, Vodafone started working on improving their response. So they would release information more quickly. They had blogs out. So they were trying to give more information. Um, but the fundamental problem was just that they hadn't invested in their network for like three years, and now everyone was using smartphones with lots of data, so the network couldn't cope. And, and you can't fix that overnight. Like, so they, they were in a really difficult situation. But what I ended up coming up with um, was I kind of did some analysis uh, with my team on all of the, the stories that were posted on Vodafone. So at that point, there were over 12,000 of them. And I took all of those stories, and we just you know, ran some simple textual analysis on them to see, you know, just to roughly categorize where they went. And we looked at the locations of different, different posts we're coming from, like different towns that seemed to have more problems than others. 
Um, like we, we had average signal strength in every postcode, almost in Australia as well. So, so we put all this data together. And then we also did a lot of background research on the company. And um, in particular, Vodafone had recently merged with uh, Three, which is a Hutchinson telecom company in, Aust in Australia. So the two companies merged, and there were cultural issues as well. Um, they were trying to cut costs by merging um, back-end systems and merging call centers. So there were all of these sort of internal things going on in the company, which, which, were, which you had to understand. And then they also, had, um, they also had financial issues as well. Like the company wasn't profitable, and they had to borrow a lot of money, so that obviously weighed on what they could do. And then they had miscalculated how much data people would use on all these phones. So we looked into a lot of these issues um, using as much information as we could and information that people were also sending us um, through the website because there are a lot of you know, active supporters all around the world. And we ended up writing a report. Um, and what we wanted to do in the report was kind of draw to a close effectively everything that people had done on the website. So the report looked at what had happened in the past, so like how Vodafone got into the situation they were in, what they had done in response to it, and what we thought they could do in the future to actually improve the service, improve the company, and hopefully win customers back. Um, because m my whole goal was not to tear down the company, it was just to, you know, I don't know, make sure the phone worked, and if the phone works, then the company will be fine. Um, and particularly with, uh, with telecom companies, there are only like three main ones in Australia. So if Vodafone collapsed, that means there's only two, and then it becomes a duopoly. And then you're going to have like, real issues, because there'll be pricing, like the prices will go up, and all that sort of stuff. So my, my hope was that they would just really fix the problem. And the whole frustration through the whole thing was that like, them not getting it, and why they weren't fixing it quick enough. I think that was everyone's uh, frustration. So we produced this report, and it's still on the website. Um, and reports often go into black holes when you write them. <laughs> so what we did with this one was, um, we partnered with a sort of government-funded uh, consumer action group who then who sent the report out to their network and it was submitted to all the regulators in Australia and the press got copies as well so they all wrote about it um, and then Vodafone obviously got a copy too. Um, but their response was, was quite funny. They're like, oh, thank you very much. This report tells us nothing new. And I thought, okay, well, I wasn't expecting much from, from you guys anyway. Um, but it, it was quite funny to watch. And I submitted it to everyone, and you know, everyone wrote about it, and, and kind of that was that. Um, but the report did draw to a close all of those things. And it also talked about um, kind of like my motivation as well. Because whenever you put yourself out there, and whenever you start something, you'll kind of become the center of attention for good or bad reasons. So there were a lot of people who spread rumors saying I worked at Optus, or I worked at Telstra, or I had a mobile shop and I was trying to drum up business, like all of these sort of things. Um, all of them are completely untrue, but one of the challenges you'll face is that people will say things, and if there's no one there to defend you, then people will kind of assume over time those things are correct. Uh, so, so it's a big challenge that you face online now where people can post anything everywhere. So you really have to be um, proactive in getting your message out there, making sure that people understand your motivations for doing things, and so that they know that you're quite genuine in what you're doing. And, and I think that's what, that's what really resonated with, with the Vote of Fail campaign. It was clear that like, I wasn't part of any organization. I was just some person who had problems that the company ignored, and I was kind of standing up on behalf of everyone. And, and that message got out very well. Um, and, and we were very good in, in making sure that that stayed the, the message. Um, but you'll always, be, you'll always get attacked for those sort of things. So uh, we answered a lot of that in the report as well. So our supporters could go out and when people said things about me or about Vote Fail, the campaign, they could go out and they could say, hey, look, listen, look at the report. It's all there. Like, these people are actually you know, honest in what they're doing. So I think that's important um, as you put yourselves out there, as you start a business, to remember that you have to make sure that your story and your message is clear and genuine. Um, and then you'll find that people will, will come along with you. So about a month um, after that, so, so between the website starting and me submitting the report was, uh, was like about seven weeks. It felt like a very long seven weeks. Um, and a lot happened, but it was seven weeks. And then a month after that, 
Vodafone announced a lot of changes, which were actually quite a few were in line with what I said in the report. Um, but I guess it took them a month to read, so it's, it was quite funny. But they said the report had no impact on them, but that's fine. A lot of times when you do things like that, uh, you have to accept that you won't get acknowledgement from everyone, and a lot of people will complain and kind of tear you down. Um, but as long as you're confident in, in what you're doing, and as long as you believe that what you're doing is right and helpful, that's all that really matters. Um, because there will always be people who attack you, but there's also like a silent majority who probably supports you. They're just like not very uh, vocal about it. Um, but in general, they, they welcomed the progress. They'd stopped denying that there were problems in the company. They stopped denying there were network issues. And they pretty much said, you know, yeah, you know, we screwed up. These are all the problems we're having. It'll probably take a couple years to fix. Like all, all of these sort of things, which although it's not, you know, a huge consolation to everyone, th at the end of the day, there's only so much they can really do. I mean, they screwed up and, you know, it takes time to fix things. So y you have to be fair as well. And I think one of the, the challenges that I faced um, through all of that was there are always people in both directions trying to get you to do things. So there are always people who want you to be angrier and to like always tear down the company or tear down whatever you're going after, even when they don't deserve it. And then there are always people who are on the opposite end, which are like, you know, cut them, cut them slack. You know, it's hard delivering a mobile network. Like, and, and you'll always see both ends of the spectrum. So you just have to be confident about, about what you believe in and what you're doing. Now, there are a few things that happened after that. So after that, um, I kind of made sure I disappeared from, from the media for a bit. And um, things like, things still kept happening on the Vodafail saga. So there was like a YouTube video called Vodafail the Musical. So someone made like a Lady Gaga music video about Vodafone, which is quite funny. Um, I could probably post it on the course <coughs> afterwards. It, it, it's enjoyable to watch. Um, but it was just, uh, yeah, it was really funny. Get, you'll watch it later. Um, and then one of the regulators that I submitted my report to uh, wrote a submission on how the telecommunications <laughs> industry in Australia should change. Um, and, and my report was one of the major submissions for that, for that, um, for that case study. And uh, beyond that, we saw all the other telecommunications companies in Australia take notice about how they did customer service. And, and you see a huge number of shifts, and I'm going to go through those. Um, but in particular, a few other things happened. Uh, so Vodaf Vodafone ended up changing their CEO um, in 2012. So like, I guess the other guy got the message. Um, and then I ended up closing the website to new complaints um, over a year ago because traffic had died down and I figured, you know, time for people to kind of move on. Um, but I guess if it's any nice consolation, Vodafone themselves adopted a lot of the stuff that, that we designed into Vodafail. Um, in particular, we had this like local profile idea. So you put in your postcode and you can see all of the um, complaints, all of the stories, all of the positive things as well. Um, so our key like story sharing thing was called share your pain. Um, but to be fair, I also created a section called share your gain. So like when you got something out of Vodafone, you could talk about it as well. Um, Needless to say, the share your pain had a lot more complaints than the other one, but you know, you can post whatever. Um, so, so they ended up, Vodafone ended up adopting that. Um, they also adopted more of a social support site. So previously, um, Vodafone just looked at how they could use social media to sell their products. And I think that's how a lot of people approached um, social media for like when it first came out, probably for the past few years. Um, and that was really the wrong way to do it. Because when people go to your Facebook or your Twitter, yeah, they want to find out like what the company offers. And like they want to hear about deals and all that sort of stuff. But usually they're not very happy. Um, so if, if they're not happy with your service and they go and they see you advertising that service like incessantly, it just makes them angrier. So um, they, they ended up learning and they, they actually added customer service staff to their social media campaigns. So they, they could actually do a bit more. Um, and they, they also fixed up their coverage mapping. So like a lot of telcos everywhere in the world have like a map where you can see you know, what, what areas they cover in terms of reception. Um, and usually they just say, hey, we cover everything. Um, now they kind of realize that doesn't work. 
and it works against them. So they've, they've largely stopped that. Feedback. Um, and then I guess the other things were you know, how to get help. So uh, we, we had all these tools on the site to help you find out the right people to contact if you had different situations. Um, and, and they built a lot of those into what they were doing. So there were a few, hmm, there were a few um, funny, funny things that ended up happening. Uh, one was like everyone searches for vote to fail. So they ended up having to buy a lot of targeted ads on, on Google. So every time you type in vote to fail, they're like, oh man, you got to go to Vodafone. So I don't know how much it cost them, but it's pretty funny to watch. So you probably see this. Um, and then the opposite happened. I'm not sure where I should stand, so feedback's worse. Um, so the opposite happened where a lot of Vodafone's competitors also bought ads for like the Vodafone keyword. So I think like, it's kind of an interesting marketing tool in many ways. Like, so when you're advertising your business, you can look for things that, you know, competitors that people are dissatisfied with, that, you know, everyone's talking about, and you can kind of latch onto those. Like, one thing we had on the site, which was kind of funny, was um, a list of all of the mobile service providers in Australia, and whether or not they use Vodafone's network. And if they use Vodafone's network, they had, like, a joke message next to them, um, which you can go to the site and still look at. But yeah, it really discouraged a lot of other resellers, probably. Um, but in general, they're doing a much better job now at keeping people informed. Um, and if you, if you talk to them now, you'll see that it, I think just in the past six months, they've made huge improvements in terms of customer service. And last I spoke to someone there, they had restructured the entire company um, to, deal, to improve customer service, to improve the, their support, their social media. Um, and they believe they've turned the corner. So, and, and I think they, um, they said their customer numbers, after losing two million customers in three years, they've now started gaining customers again. So it's taken them a long time, um, which I guess it shows, you know, it's not easy to turn around a company of that size, um, but it can be done if, if, you really, if you really focus on it. And if you're just willing to kind of let go of all the things you did previously. Like the only way they were able to turn around was that they no longer like they kind of just shed, well, obviously a lot of staff, um, but also a lot of the old ways of doing things. And, and that really made a difference. So there are just a couple um, recent things. So by now, over a million people, uh, I think a million people, have visited Vodafone um, from all around the world, uh, largely Australia. And even though the site is like in an archive sort of form now, people still visit the site on a daily basis. Um, I don't know how many. You can actually go and there's like a stats link and it'll tell you exactly how many. Um, quite transparent. But there's some, um, there some really interesting, interesting things that have come out of it. And there have been a lot of case studies around the world. Um, as far as I know, like it's been studied at Stanford and Harvard and across Australia. And it shows up in the press all the time. Um, and in many ways, Vodafone is just such a neat way to describe like any problem that people use it even when, when they're not having issues with Vodafone. So like if there's a problem with your stove, people will say like Vodafone on Twitter. So it's probably not what, probably not what you want. Um, but I think just in summary, there are a few things that, that I've learned along the way and that's you can't plan everything or in some cases anything. Um, you know, when I first started this website, all I wanted to do was get my phone fixed because I thought then I'd go start a company. And I did end up starting that company, but the Vodafone, the Vodafone experience had such an impact on, on my life that it actually caused me to quit the graduate job that I was supposed to start like in two months time because I thought to myself, you know, me like sitting there in my like little room in like Sydney, Australia, so far away from the rest of the world was able to create this little thing for practically no money and then get everyone in the country to go to the website. And then because of that, all the telecommunications companies in Australia took notice and changed customer service, increased their service standards, Vodafone changed the way they were doing things. So all of those sort of things were possible. Um, but I'd never really known that before. I'd always thought, like, before you started something, you had to, like, have saved up a lot of money, or you had to like have tons of experience, or like be someone who's well connected, but that turned out not to be the case. Um, so I think that was one of the major things in my life that encouraged me 
to, to quit the like, quite lucrative graduate job I was supposed to start and just go and try my own thing. Um, because, like, and I guess it also gave me a lot of confidence that, those sort of, that you can do those sort of things as an individual. And a lot of people talk about you know, how you know, I guess everything's stacked against you, you know, you're just students, you're just graduates, you know, whatever the reason, th there'll be excuses. But if, you're th if you think you're doing something worthwhile, and if you believe in it, then, then you can make a difference, and people will, will come along for the ride. Now, there's some fun customer service tips that I've learned as well. Um, I joke that now like, I have to have the highest customer service standards in the world, otherwise there's be some guy like me, and then he'll come screw up my company. Now, that's probably not the case, hopefully, but um, there are a few simple things that, that I want to share with you about customer service. So one is to always put yourself in the customer's position, um, which seems obvious, but is easy to, to forget. So an example of that is like when you call up a company and you have a problem, and then they say, oh, we can't do anything, it's our company policy. And it's like, who wrote the policy? Like, really? Like, some person wrote it, and then they put it in, and now you follow it. Like, but, but as a customer, that's very frustrating. So you just have to think about, well, first of all, does this policy even make sense? Like, why do we have a policy in the first place? The policy, maybe it should just be, you know, help the customer. Like, th there are lots of simple things. So if you just think about it from, like, an upset customer's point of view, um, I think you'll be able to solve most problems very quickly. And then the other, the other thing that I think about is kind of this, what I call like an inverse reaction to, to someone. And I guess this works not just in customer service, but in anything. So when someone's upset and angry about something, the worst thing you can do is like be upset and angry with them, like and argue with them. Like that, that's just going to make things far, far worse. And that's usually what happens in call centers because like in most cases, they just don't want to escalate your problem. So they just like kind of argue with you until you kind of give up. And if you don't give up, you might start a website. So I think one of the things that, that you make sure you have to do is, if someone is upset and angry, just be like happy and like helpful. And then, you know, if nothing else, that'll kind of rub off. And also you'll find that by try, trying to be happy and helpful, you'll probably solve their problem. And they'll, they'll come away much happier. So it, it's just, a, I guess it's just a mindset. Um, that whenever you're dealing with someone who's kind of angry or upset, just don't, don't be like that, and you'll be fine. Um, and then I think something that, that we've really taken on to heart on open learning in particular is this idea of just delighting your customers. And for us at open learning, that's delighting our students. So everything that we do, we think about in terms of how can we make the customer, how can we make the student, how can we make the teacher's experience better, and how can we make them happy? Um, and we talk about that in terms of providing a delightful experience to everyone who uses our product. And it's very challenging. Um, and like, I don't know that anyone ever gets there where things are perfect. But if you just have that at heart, um, then it'll drive a lot of what you do. And you'll, ma you'll make much better decisions. Um, and, and at the end of the day, as Mushtaq um, said, you know, you start a business and you do anything because of the, the people involved, because of the customer, because of a problem you're trying to solve. So you just always have to have that in your mind. And providing good customer service is really just the way that you know, people are going to interact with you and the company. So if your customer service isn't good, you won't be around very long, no matter how big your company is. So I think that's, um, that's pretty much it for me. Um, I think one of the important things is that if you do want to start something like this or start a business, make sure the problem that you, you're solving and the challenges that you have are really genuine and you really believe them. You know, a lot of people, after I did this Vodafone thing, they email me and they say, oh, can you um, do something for the insurance industry? There are a lot of problems. Can you do something about, you know, this bank or the electricity company? And I thought, you know, first of all, yeah, they're probably pretty bad as well, but I didn't really have a personal issue. So I shouldn't be the person leading that campaign. It has to be someone who's really impacted by it, who really feels it. Um, and it's just like when you're starting a business. If you don't have the desire and the passion for the problem and for the product that you're building, you can't fake it. And if you're not the biggest advocate of what you're doing, no one's gonna, no one's gonna help you, no one's gonna be involved. So you always have to, to go back to having a genuine story, solving a genuine problem. And for everyone, that's going to be different, and that's fine. There'll always be someone in every area who will, who will solve the problems that matter to them. Um, and I think I've also learned that one person can obviously make a difference. 
And I think it's easy to always look at that and think, yeah, you know, it's possible. These things happen. Um, but they can happen to you as well. Like, I don't think I'm special in any way. You know, it just so happened that when my phone didn't work and someone said, I'm not letting you out of your contract, I just kind of kept pushing the boundary. Um, and in many ways, it's just a natural extension of everything else you do. When, when you really want something and when you really think something is unjust, you can just, you know, I guess, lie down and and just say, I give up. But at the end of the day, like, if you don't stand up for it, no one else will. Um, and whether that's consumer activism or starting a business, you just really have to, have to believe in what you're doing. So that's, that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me on Open Learning. I'm there all the time. Or you can send me an email. So, thanks, everyone. And if you have any questions, let me know. I think we have uh, some time for a uh, few questions, if, uh, if you have any. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, what kind of relationship do you have with Vodafone, Vodafone today? Um, I don't have any relationship with them. So uh, so, okay. I, um, I stopped being a customer like two weeks into the campaign, um, but I kept it going. So and okay. yeah, no relationship now. So they don't give you like a hamper every year? <laughs> No, if they did, I probably wouldn't eat anything in there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would like to ask, um, based on your experience in Vodafone, right, and how do it actually lead you to open learning, the gap in between? Mm. Because this is something that you, you personally have established, and that, the other one, was the previous one you experienced. So the, the gap in between, I always curious people how people lead to something big, Mm. And from what the experience they, they gathered before? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, I guess, how did I make the jump from doing Vodafone to open learning? Um, and there was a, a big gap in between. I think the reason is that when you, when you put yourself out there and you do something, people take notice. So I made a lot of good con contacts and connections uh, once I did that, because I was in the press and people could see I was doing things. And I guess um, because of that, uh, Richard actually probably came to me. I, I know, I'd known Richard for a long time. He was my first professor at university. Um, and I think after the Vodafone thing, he kind of took notice of me again probably. And then he came to me and said, you know, I've been working on these things, I want to do something. And it just seemed like a natural fit of all the things that I'd been passionate about. So I think if you put yourself out there, then opportunities will come. Um, and you don't know what they are, like you can't plan for them. But you just have to be open to trying them out and seeing what happens. Like I didn't know if open learning would work, but here we are, like two and a half years later or whatever, and it seems pretty awesome. So, yeah, you just have to do it. Um, her name is Yasmin Ginairi, and her question. She has two questions. The question number one is: What big steps have you taken to transform the whole project? from an idea into a reality. And I believe she talks about open learning. OK. Yeah. And um, the second question is, what major challenges and obstacles have you faced in the uh, processes to achieve the goal and make it happen? OK. So um, I guess the first question, going from idea to reality, is always a challenge. Um, usually your ideas, if you're good, are much larger than what can really be accomplished in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and there's this whole idea when in starting a business, particularly startups, about a minimum viable product. And I think that, that's particularly challenging to get right. Uh, because you know, myself, Richard, David, our whole team, we have a lot of ideas. Uh, ideas that will keep us busy for probably 20 years for, for education. Uh, and you know, with unlimited resources, we'd still find a way to, to exhaust them. So, I think one of the things that they look at is what's the, what's the most important set of things that you can put together for the amount of resources that you have and just get that out. Um, and that concept is it's a concept of a minimum viable product, but it's, it's, very, it's actually quite difficult because uh, particularly for open learning, when we look at like a minimum viable product, for us that has to be something that's incredible because to us everything else is not very good. So we're building something that we say this is going to be the best, most fantastic learning experience you'll ever have, well, like, there's not really a minimum there. It's, it's hard to define a minimum set of features for that. But you have to try. Um, so one thing you end up doing is uh, you just 
you put something out there, even if it's not perfect. But just knowing that it's better than anything else, that's enough to get you going. So the first version of open learning we put out, um, we worked on for, I don't know, six months, a year, I don't remember. And we put it out there, and we weren't terribly proud of the first version that we put out there. But it was a huge step. And we still think it was better than anything else. And over time, we've you know, made improvements, had new ideas, implemented new things. And now it's at a stage where like, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, but if we waited like two years before getting to what we have now, we never would have got there. Because in that time, we've had people come on board, use it, give us more feedback. So, so going from idea to a product can take a while. But you just have to usually make some sacrifices to get something out that's much better. Uh, and for us, that was, that was very challenging, but we pulled it off. So, and the second question, um, I guess, what obstacles? Yes, and challenges that you faced. OK, so um, that's always like everything every day seems like a challenge or an obstacle uh, when you're starting a business. I mean, you have to deal with everything from like, finding the right people to help you out to working out how you pay them. Because like, as a startup, you don't have any revenue. So you have to attract investors, or you have to invest your own time and money into it. Um, like, you'll have to take time off for your job. You'll have to quit your job. You'll have to dedicate yourself to making it work. So there are a whole host of, um, like, every, every function of the business is a challenge. And on top of that, there are also things you don't know you have to do when starting a company. And usually you, don't, you only find out when like, someone tells you, usually like the tax office or like, you know, a lawyer that you've got to do certain things. So, so you're always learning constantly what to do. So you never really know. So a lot of, there are challenges you don't know that have come up until they've passed. Um, but then finding the right people and keeping them motivated and, and retaining them is very challenging, um, particularly with a software company like Open Learning, where you're competing with like Google and Microsoft for good people. And like, that's hard, because as a startup, you can't pay as much money as Google and Microsoft. But what you can offer is something where people will actually make immediate impact on people's lives. Like you make changes to open learning, and tens of thousands of people around the world will enjoy them. So we can provide these sort of things, but it's still very difficult to find the right people, keep them motivated, do obviously have, have great customer service, while also releasing features quickly to customers. So everything's a challenge. Um, but you know, you get through it, and it's worth it. How do you manage the back end? Because you know, like, I like Facebook when they had the search. They, you have to manage the back end in terms of the servers, in terms of mm. the network, and so on. So yeah. how how do you? What is your wisdom behind? Because people want to start a software company. Yeah. Suddenly they get four hundred thousand users, <laughs> and the system crashes and doesn't run. You know, or got security issues, or got all these issues. How do you uh, deal with these kind of issues? In a nutshell, unless it's top secret. Okay. <laughs> it's not top secret. Um, it's, it's much easier now than it would have been like five years ago because there's so many cloud hosting services that will run all the servers for you. Um, you still have to know how to manage all of them. So for us, it is actually a fairly decent sized task managing all of that infrastructure, even though it is hosted by Rackspace and Amazon, like in other places. Um, but in general, you don't want to worry about scaling too much before you have those users. Um, because like, putting all your time and effort into making a hugely scalable product and then releasing it is usually why a lot of startups fail, because they do that and then they realize they don't have the right thing the customer wants. Um, and, but you also, you rarely find a startup that has failed by having like, scaling issues. Like Twitter, I think, is probably the best example. Um, obviously, you want it to be as reliable as possible. But if you have something that's just so much better than everything else people can use, they will put up with minor inconveniences. Like Twitter is, is a great example because like their error page is now like ingrained in the internet, like the fail whale. Like people have seen their error page probably more than the actual Twitter service in the early days, yet they were still like acquiring users like no tomorrow. Um, now for us, we can't do that obviously because people rely on our platform like 24/7. So we have to. Have a fail whale. No, although we're thinking of it, we're gonna have a, something like that probably pretty soon. We might have a game, actually. We'll, we'll see how we go. But, uh, so we do manage all that. It is challenging. Um, there are a lot of services you can use that do all of it for you. But you still need to be fairly technical to understand how it all works. Um, what inspired you to start Open Learning? And what's your future goal for Open Learning? 
you could like start any other businesses, but why open learning? Yeah. So I, I guess it's um it's interesting. The main reason why we started open learning is probably because uh, Richard's passion for education and teaching, which was actually the way I was educated as well. So Richard was my first lecturer at university, and that kind of set the tone for what I thought like education could be like, which is like focus on problem solving, self discovery, helping each other out, like doing doing things together in a community and having all that social interaction in a computer science course. Like normally you don't expect that. So so all of that w was uh, re really made a difference to me. Um, and education in particular is one of the few sectors where you can have such a dramatic impact on people's lives. And it's just such a necessity, but yet at the same time it's done so poorly in many places. Like most people don't actually enjoy like a lot of stuff they do at school or university, yet everyone still like has to go through it. So if we can make that experience better, then it can just improve like not just individuals' lives, but like entire countries. Um, and and that, that, really is, that really means something to us. And I guess um, if I could do anything, like I, I'd do this, because like, I, don't, I don't know of anything else that can have such a big impact and where we can have such a, make such a big difference. Um, and also it's just so much fun, like building something that people love to use and also helps them learn better and have more fun doing it. It's a perfect combination for us. Um, but like, there are lots of other good ideas, so you don't have to start a competitor or anything. <laughs> So I would really like you to uh, give Adam a very big hand for a very engaging and interesting talk. So I, I, I think with this, I would like to thank you very much for uh, being here on time, for uh, participating, and um, uh, see you at the next class. Thank you very much.